When Canadians think about grasslands, they tend to picture the prairies of Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba with their wide open spaces and grazing bison and antelope. But some of the most magnificent grasslands in Canada are the grasslands found in the deep valleys that bisect the mountains and plateaus of British Columbia's southern interior. The bunchgrass ecosystem is found in the hottest, driest parts of the Okanagan, Similkameen, Thompson, Fraser and Nicola valleys of British Columbia. While there are other scattered grasslands across the province, this is the only major ecological zone in BC where grasslands are the dominant plant communities. Grasslands in general constitute less than 1% of BC's total land area, but are home to a large array of distinctive biodiversity. I always talk about grasslands as being the Rodney Dangerfield of ecosystems because they get no respect. Uh, grasslands are pockets of not only diversity, but pockets of species at risk. And a lot of people think of grassland as just, well, it's a Walmart waiting to happen or it's a suburb waiting to happen. They don't recognize it as an ecosystem like they would a forest or a wetland. So we kind of fight that mentality, but times are changing. Diverse First Nations make these grasslands home and have fundamentally shaped these grasslands over millennia harvesting the plants and wildlife, and setting fires to foster useful plants and forage for deer and bighorn sheep. Well, I think our relation to all land is sacred, because when we look at our land, you know, we call it in Hulhuelten, and then that's the, that gives us life. So every aspect of our land is sacred to us, because like anywhere you go, like when you walk around here, you look around and, you know, people just see bushes and shrubs and whatnot. Um, that gives us life in terms of food or medicines or for use in ceremonies and different things. And um, now we're dealing with impacts to that. These grasslands share the low precipitation of the prairie grasslands, but can be even drier and hotter in the summer with mild winters. They're also home to many wildlife species found on the Canadian prairies. American badgers, white-tailed jackrabbits, Nuttall's cottontails, burrowing owls, rattlesnakes, spadefoots, and yellow-bellied racers. But they're also home to species not found on the prairies. Canyon wrens, night snakes, rubber boas, California bighorn sheep, and spotted and pallid bats. One of the interesting things about where we are right now is that we are at the very northern tip of what's called the Great Basin Biome, which is a dry, mostly grassland, shrubland ecosystem that extends southward from us into eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, all the way down to Utah, Nevada. If you think of sagebrush, then that gives you an idea of what that biome is. So all the species associated in that Great Basin biome that are dirt and grassland adapted, we find them here in this little pocket. In terms of genetics, the northern edge of any species range genetically is very important because those creatures or plants are living in marginal conditions and so they have more adaptability and they have a wider gene pool than say something that's in the middle of its range down in Utah or someplace like that. So this area is important ecologically and genetically as well. Sadly, these grasslands contain some of the largest concentrations of species at risk in Canada. This is particularly true in the very hottest, driest valley bottom of the South Okanagan Valley, where the so-called pocket desert is found, characterized by the presence of antelope brush, a large woody shrub that can tower taller than a human. Antelope brush is a fascinating plant. I've just kind of, kind of become an antelope brush uh, groupie, I guess. It's found throughout the, that Great Basin biome and pockets here and there. It looks very much like sagebrush until you're up closer. It has a darker color. Uh, it is habitat for uh, several um, endangered butterflies. Um, it is like alfalfa in that it fixes ni its own nitrogen. It supplies its own nitrogen through a, a symbiotic association with, with uh, microbes in the soil. Uh, it can get quite tall. Uh, here and there you can see antelope brush that's two and even three meters tall. It's almost like a tree. It has very spotty distribution in the Okanagan. Uh, it extends up to, I think, Olala. North of Kelowna is the last one we've been able to find. 
Uh, very spotty distribution because a lot of it has been plowed up already because antelope brush land is good grape land, has a good aspect and good soils for grapes. While not quite dry enough to be a true desert, the antelope brush ecosystem here comes closest in Canada to being a desert. The hot, dry climate and the large, beautiful lakes in the region make the Okanagan Valley in general coveted as a place for human habitation and agriculture, greatly endangering its unique ecosystems. Development has also destroyed most of the extremely rich riparian cottonwood, shrub, and wetland ecosystems along the rivers, streams, and lakes here. We look at, you know, that we want to save these lakes, we want to save these areas, we want to do these things. Rather than, you know, we, oh yeah, let's level that and make a moonscape and put 50 houses on there. Because when we look at the Kelowna, you know, it was this big, now it's this big. Besides suburban sprawl and agricultural conversion for orchards and vineyards, other threats abound. These grasslands have never had bison and the relentless grazing pressure that bison exert, which prairie grasses and ecosystems have evolved with. However, the bunch grass and other native grasses here are much more sensitive to overgrazing by cattle, which results in the overabundance of sage, a native species, and the invasion of non-native grasses and weeds. Fire suppression also threatens the ecosystem as trees invade the grasslands and shade out the grassland species. Well, some of our grasslands have disappeared because of encroachment of forests. You walk out there and people just look at it and say, oh, it's grass, it's this and this. We walk out there and look and say, well, here's this food, there's this and there's that, you know, medicines and different things. So those are some of the things that we look at. It, it, it brings the life back to the land through fire. So when we do a ceremonial burn, you know, we call that a traditional burn or ceremonial burn, is that we're asking to clean off a certain area and all the medicines and the different things, and even the, uh, what we call, like I said, Tameh that live there, have a place for themselves. So when you look at a fire, even a ca catastrophic fire, it doesn't burn 100% of it. You look at it and you'll see patterns of green space in there. Even though when you look at it, you think nothing's gonna survive. But fighting fire, you know, you go in there after the fire has gone through, and. Pretty soon the rattlesnakes coming out, the, the toads and whatnot are, that are living there, grasshoppers even, and different things. Fire knows what needs to be left. Today, with the large human populations in many of these grassland valleys, controlled burns are a vital management tool to help restore the balance and biodiversity of these native grasslands. While still lacking sufficient protection, BC grasslands in recent years have become the increasing focus of land trusts and conservation organizations and some key areas have fortunately been protected. Most recently, a new national park reserve in the South Okanagan and Similkameen Valleys has been in the planning stages, with talks between the Seal Ix First Nations, the province, and Parks Canada on the conditions and boundaries for a potential national park reserve. The park has been thought about for a long, long time. I believe that in 1976 there were even studies to, to look at this as a, a national park. Um, our member of parliament now, Dick Cannings, did that study. Um, so I, I think it was in the year 2000 that they took the proposal to uh, uh, Prime Minister Kretchen, along with First Nations and local government people, and the, um, it, they started onto a feasibility study at that time. Um, and it's just been an ongoing process. If this National Park Reserve comes to fruition, it'll become one of the greatest conservation achievements in Canadian history to protect one of the country's most endangered ecosystems. I really believe that the National Park here is going to protect these lands. They aren't really protected, although they are called protected lands. They aren't protected. They, there's overgrazing, there's um, recreational use that is, is unmanaged. Um, I think these lands are not going to survive forever with that kind of use. So it, it needs some um, proper management. Um, like people say, oh, nobody's going to move there. Wow, <laughs> take a look at the Okanagan. It is just growing in leaps and bounds. The protection of the spectacular interior grasslands in BC must be a first-rate priority for those concerned about endangered species and ecosystems. 
As the world moves to protect nature to avert the extinction and climate crises, the BC and federal governments must quickly expand the protected area system with ecosystem-based targets, including for the unique and amazing Intermountain grasslands in British Columbia.